Chapter Seven of the Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, Malvina Bennett, Dressmaker. The dressmaking establishment of Miss Malvina Bennett had become a sort of clearing house for general and miscellaneous information. Seated in Miss Malvina's little parlour, in close juxtaposition to the ornate base burner. The votaries of fashion, as represented by a pile of highly coloured magazines, might learn many things concerning the world at large, but more particularly of Innisfield. Miss Malvina herself would have repudiated the title of gossip with entirely just indignation. If there's one thing more than another I hate and despise, she was wont to declare with deep feeling, it's tale bearing and gossiping. I mind my business, and I expect my customers to mind theirs the whole enduring time. Anybody that sews has got to watch out for their tongues. As I says to mother, there's something about settin' and sewing, I says, more especially bastin, that does somehow tempt a body to tittle-tattle. But there ain't anybody can say I was ever known to repeat what comes to my ears in the shop. And I ain't saying I don't know about as well as most folks what's going on in this town. With which tacit admission, Miss Malvina invited fresh confidences of the sort one makes to a discreet person whose mouth is filled with pins, while with a pair of sharp scissors she deftly clips about the circle of one's neck in dangerous nearness to the jugular vein, or with the same shining implement snips suddenly and with apparent recklessness under one's armpit. Miss Bennett was a wiry little person, who had never looked young, even in the days when she toddled solemnly about her grandmother's kitchen, in sedate and unsuccessful pursuit of an elderly kitten. By the time she was eight, Malvina could overcast a seam as neat as a pin. At ten, she was sewing her own flannel petticoats, without manifesting a single carnal desire to run out of doors and frolic with other children. I guess the Lord created me special to be a dressmaker, was Miss Malvina's pious comment on the workings of a providence which appeared to have closed every other avenue of usefulness, save the one the little seamstress trod so carefully. And having never been young, meaning that Miss Malvina was never in the least rosy, nor pretty, nor idle, nor imprudent, and that in consequence of all these negative virtues she never had a beau, so likewise she did not grow old the way other and more fortunate people did. No one remembered just when Malvina had taken to wearing glasses, because the large steel-bowed spectacles bequeathed to her from her grandmother appeared so eminently fitting an addition to her somewhat nipped and wintry little nose. So also the adoption of a much befrizzed black hair front, also an heirloom, but every bit as good as new, made little or no change in Miss Malvina's everyday aspect, even when the frizzed front became, in certain exigencies, pushed rakishly to one side, revealing sparse grey hair combed neatly back to join the rigid pepper-and-salt knob at the back of her head. "'Here's a hand-glass, Mrs. Puffer,' exhorted Miss Malvina, pressing upon her customer a small cracked mirror. "'I want you should look at your back. There! Ain't that a neat fit? It couldn't lay no smoother nor set no snugger I don't care who done it. Land, I do hope and pray you'll get a chance to wear this dress while it's stylish. Last year, I remember, no sooner did I get that velveteen skirt fitted down to you than you had to lay it aside. Now I suppose it's too narrow. You seem to be somewhat stouter since the last baby was born. I think I hear him crying, interrupted Mrs. Puffer resignedly. I left him outside in his go-cart asleep. Oh, don't you dare stir, warned the dressmaker with a threatening gesture. I just got them goods pinned onto you in a real stylish draped effect. You know, like the one you was admiring in the arts and modes. I'll take a peek at the baby. Anyhow, you couldn't move if you was to try. Mrs. Puffer, a stout, matronly person, with a perpetual pucker of anxiety between her mild blue eyes, relaxed obediently in the swaddling clothes of her inchoate gown. "'As long as he don't get under the strap and choke himself to death,' she sent after Miss Malvina's retreating steps, 
Dr. Holt says it don't hurt many to cry. And you might turn him over and give him his pacifier. It's round his neck on a pink cord. Miss Malvina returned presently, her face wreathed in smiles. You don't need to worry a mite about the baby, she said. Who do you suppose has got him? Taking care of him like she was his mother from way back. Mrs. Puffer didn't know she was sure, and became restive once more under Miss Bennet's formative hand. Now you just stand still, Miss Puffer, or I can't do nothing. These here pernickety folds is the very dickens if you don't get em right first off. I was just going to tell you if you'll quit prancing. Philura Rice, well, I mean Mrs. Petbone, was coming along, and she heard him. <laughs> sure enough, he was down in under the strap, his face as red as a beet. My, you ought to have seen her. Whose baby is it? she says to me, all pink and excited. I've got Miss Puffer all pinned up in ten yards of dress goods inside, I says, and begun to hunt in his blankets for his pacifier. But land, <laughs> Philura, she had him out before you could say Jack Robinson. I'll take care of him, she says. I'd love to. Mrs. Puffer sighed a transient relief. Well, now, that's real kind of Miss Philura, she said, twisting her head to gaze at the reflection of her large person in the glass. But I do hope she won't drop him. Miss Bennet cackled appreciatively as she took another pin from between her closed teeth. She won't drop him, she hazarded, but it wouldn't surprise me none if she run off with him for a spell. Philura always had a hankering after babies. Outside in the warm April sunshine, the minister's wife was talking confidentially to the new parishioner. Upon being extricated from his perilous position, young Master Puffer had instantly ceased his half-strangled cries for maternal aid, and was gazing in round-eyed wonderment the new and interesting phenomenon of a hat with nodding plumes and a pink rose in the front. The face under the hat was almost as pink as the rose, and two blue eyes gazed at him soulfully. The unfamiliar voice, too, had a pleasing cadence, and the stranger's embracing arms held his small, plump person as he liked to be held. After a period of reflection, the baby opened his rosy mouth in a puckered circle, and a sound came out. It wasn't just what he meant to say, but it served the purpose. Oh, you darling, cried the minister's little wife, you sweet, precious lamb. Then she buried her hungry little mouth in his warm, fat neck. The new parishioner betrayed no resentment. He was, in fact, used to such demonstrations. He continued to gaze delightedly at the pink rose and the pink cheek and the blue shining eyes of his captor, waving his small dimpled hands uncertainly towards the objects of his desire. I'd like to carry you off, were the traitorous words the lady whispered in his ear. You'd like me for a mother just as well as Mrs. Puffer, wouldn't you, sweetness? And, oh, I'd love you. I'd love you so. At this bold speech, the baby blinked dazedly, and then closed his eyes, as if the better to consider her audacious proposal. Oh, you're sleepy, precious, inferred his self-appointed guardian. And somewhat awkwardly, she stowed him among his blankets and pillows. With a sigh of content, the new parishioner tucked a small but useful thumb into his mouth and resigned himself to blissful slumber. If you were mine, murmured the unprincipled person who had thus deliberately broken the Tenth Commandment, I should never, never leave you outside to cry while I was being fitted for a stupid dress. Then she began wheeling the perambulator slowly up and down the sidewalk, though she might better have gone about her business, which chanced to be a meeting of the Ladies' Aid and Missionary Society. If I should stop wheeling him for a single minute, Mrs. Pettibone excused herself mendaciously, he would certainly wake up and cry. And if Malvina Bennett has pinned a draped skirt on Mrs. Puffer, she'll insist on basting it before she lets her go. There was a shabby, mud-bespattered motor-car standing before the next house but one. Mrs. Pettibone eyed it with passing interest. There were very few automobiles in the conservative village of Innisfield. This one, she knew, belonged to Dr. North, 
and its presence before a house usually betokened sickness within she wondered vaguely if mrs salter was suffering with another of her spells and whether it was her duty as the pastor's wife to stop and inquire just then the door flew open as if under the urge of an impatient hand and dr north emerged in the act of pulling on his driving gloves he was a tall stout man with a weather-beaten face half hidden by a great grey beard the doctor complained certain of his patients was always in a hurry he had abandoned his overworked grey cob in favour of an automobile in a day when the latter means of locomotion was no less than an extravagance and thereafter appeared always in the act of hastily entering houses from which he has abruptly emerged the periods between being wholly negligible to mrs pettibone's great astonishment this energetic practitioner stopped short at the sight of her one foot already in his car good afternoon miss philura he hailed her in his big hearty voice a voice be it said which had more than once recalled a trembling soul from the very brink of a new and untried existence to the dear familiar duties of a mundane life that your baby mrs pettibone blushed becomingly he's mrs puffer's baby she explained with an unconscious sigh i'm just taking care of him while his mother has a dress fitted at malvina bennett's dr north gazed thoughtfully at the rather shabby perambulator exuding pink and blue woolly things and then at the little lady who grasped its handle there was no mistaking the look of wistful eagerness in her face the doctor had seen it many times before in the course of a longish practice most of which had concerned itself with women he is a, he is a lovely baby murmured mrs pettibone curiously embarrassed she stopped to tuck a pink blanket under a blue one and patted the rotund little bunch underneath with a gentle hand of course of course agreed the doctor cheerfully the puffer children are a fine healthy lot pity there aren't more like them well i must be off good day the car leapt forward and then paused obediently under the doctor's masterful hand why say mrs philura well, oh i beg your pardon mrs pettibone can't seem to get used to the change why don't you adopt one adopt oh you don't mean a baby yes certainly just that you're fond of children and heaven knows there's plenty of poor little things that need a mother think it over he was gone in a spatter of liquid mud leaving the dazed and agitated recipient of his counsels to consider his surprising suggestion plenty of children without mothers and yes plenty of mothers without children that was what he meant could this in any wise satisfy the secret longing which of late had begun to clamour more loudly than ever within her mrs pettibone recalled stealthy moments spent in the seclusion of her mother's attic caressing a battered doll once the joy and solace of her childhood on her twelfth birthday the doll had been summarily relegated to the garret big girls in their teens she was told rebukingly did not play with doll babies but the bereaved little mother bedewed her patchwork with more than one bitter tear before she ceased to mourn the pink and white image which had been just the right size to hug but there had always been something a stray kitten sick with hunger a puppy with a broken leg a forlorn chicken hatched in the middle of winter by a fatuous old hen who refused to mother her offspring even a rose bush rooted out from a neighbouring garden and doomed to ignominious death in the ash barrel because forsooth its cheerful blossoms were a common shade of red all these bits of almost unnoticed wreckage on the tide of life had miss philura painstakingly rescued and loved back into life and beauty the starving kitten had developed into the big maltese cat which now patrolled the ministerial precincts with a magnificent air of condescension the puppy in due course recovered and thereafter trotted on four good legs after the butterwoman's wagon while the lone chicken grown to a lordly cock reigned paramount over a flock of silly hens with stern masterfulness as for the disgraced rosebush <laughs> 
planted in miss philura's little garden enriched and watered and guarded from encroaching insects it had become a glory and a delight the common red of its despised blossoms had deepened and brightened into a crimson splendour which drew even the eyes of the disdainful person next door he came he saw he leaned across the fence with an ingratiating smile miss philura won't you tell me the name of that wonderful rose of yours he entreated i don't think we've got anything like it in our rose garden and then oh then was the moment of rare triumph which crowned the work of many months i call this the ash barrel rose quoth miss philura very bright-eyed and demure something of all this memory and retrospect and vague forecasting of the future flitted through mrs pettibone's thoughts as she continued to wheel the puffer baby up and down the sunshiny street and then quite breathless and exuberantly apologetic descended mrs puffer oh i am so sorry what must you think of me but really mrs pettibone you needn't have bothered his pacify oh naughty boy he has his thumb in his mouth i never allow him to suck his thumb it ruins the shape of the mouth dwarfs the thumb and causes adenoids oh you didn't know it oh of course not how could you i'll take him now and i do hope you're not all tired out how complacent and self-satisfied she looked and with what scarifying indifference she bounced the perambulator over the curb in her haste to depart mrs pettibone stood watching the mother of many children with undefined resentment for a fleeting moment which yet marked a momentous resolve then she walked sedately toward the church where the ladies were diligently sewing calico blouses for the mountain whites End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of the Heart of Philora by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 The Orns. Censorious persons, of whom there were a select few in the neighbourhood of Innisfield, annually criticised the Orns dooryard. There were too many flowers, they said of too many varieties growing in the rounds and squares and crescents that caleb orne had pridefully laid out for his young wife back in the fifties that sort of thing was well enough they pointed out when one had plenty of money and could afford the time necessary to the cultivation of a large flower garden but as everybody knew the orns had little to depend upon except the vegetables old orne raised in the half-acre plot behind the house and the milk of the two cows pastured in the dwindling orchard. Grandma Orne, as people called the apple-cheeked old woman, owned a loom, and eked out the family livelihood by converting myriad balls of carpet rags into sober, substantial breadths of floor covering, justly esteemed by all thrifty housewives. Then there was Milly. It was Milly who worked among the flowers, rising often in the earliest flush of summer dawns, to weed and water and dig about the old-fashioned shrubs and perennials which had grown and flourished and multiplied exceedingly since the day grandfather orne planted them there grandfather used to joke milly about her gardening declaring that she stole the fresh colour in her cheeks from the pinks and roses long before anybody was up to catch her at it as for her eyes no flowers de luce larkspurs bachelor's buttons or johnny jump-ups could show a prettier blue he always ended did grandfather with a chastening comparison of milly's looks with the superlative charms of grandmother in her younger days there ain't no use talking you can't hold a candle to your grandma when i married her the old man would chuckle gleefully tell you what grandma and me was one of the finest looking couples anywhere around weren't we grandma Oh, for all i'm so bent over and wrinkled up now i was the tallest straightest best-looking chap you'd want to see had my pick of all the girls I tell you you don't see no more like i was in them days ain't that so grandma clean as a whistle and strong say i'll bet i could have lifted two of them little whippersnappers that comes buzzing round milly here and throwed em clean over the barn <laughs> yes sir your grandpa wa'n't no slouch of a man. 
but if the girl ventured ever so timidly to touch upon later family history with questions concerning her father and mother both of whom had died in her infancy the old man would stamp away pretending not to hear his wrinkled old face drawn into folds and puckers of wrathful grief i wouldn't pester grandpa no more if i was you honey counselled her grandmother soothingly it makes him kind of crabbity and out of sorts to hark back to the time when you was little you see honey your mother was all the child we had so your grandpa naturally set a lot of store by her and our milly well, she died when you was born that's why i wouldn't ask grandpa no more questions about them days if i was you was my mother pretty like me inquired little milly innocently did you ever hear the like of that commented mrs orne rebukingly who said you was pretty i'd like to know you don't want to pay no attention to grandpa when he's gassing about your looks he can't see so very well without his specs most anybody would look pretty to him pretty is as pretty does you want to remember that but yes you do favour our milly considerable she was a mite taller and her hair was some yellower than yours it come clear down to her knees a curling all the way my i remember how i used to comb it out for her out in the sun she liked it done that way her a settin on one of the kitchen chairs under the apple tree and me a coaxing that beautiful soft shining hair through a big comb that i'd bought on purpose and a fine tooth comb such as me and grandpa always used couldn't get down to her head no how the old woman's faded eyes shone with sudden tears she wiped them stealthily on her gingham apron our milly was light complected like you she added softly after a long pause and my father entreated little milly won't you tell me was he do i look like we want neither of us willing you should bear his name the old woman said stiffly me and grandpa adopted you right after our milly died you was a poor little wailing mite of a thing i never expected to raise you in them days no you run along honey and mind don't worry your grandpa no more like enough he'd get right up on his year and scold real hard if you was to try it so little milly had weeded her flowers and wiped the dishes for grandma and combed grandpa's thin grey hair with the fine tooth comb on a sunday afternoon while he dozed peacefully in his chair all under the luminous cloud of romantic mystery which in truth was no mystery at all but only one of those melancholy commonplaces people bury out of sight with their dead the short woeful story of the first millicent horn was no secret to many but few ever spoke of it except by way of whispered comment on the fresh young beauty of the girl who was growing into blooming womanhood under the guardianship of the two old people they hoped she wouldn't go the way of her mother and wondered in discreet whispers what had become of the handsome young stranger who had come to innisfield one summer to recover the health shattered by a long illness he had gone away in the autumn and the following spring millicent orne died that was all and even the most censorious could see no reason why little milly should know grief and shame had left their mark on the two old people but they bore the ever-recurrent smart of the old wound with patience and sometimes for thus benignantly do the passing years smooth and ameliorate mortal agonies they almost forgot the green mound once a gaping grave in the exquisite renaissance of milly quite simply and openly mrs orne cherished a single ambition for her granddaughter i want milly should get married she would say to grandfather as the two watched the girl flitting about among the flowers i want she should marry young it'll be a heap better for her at this straightforward avowal on the part of his wife grandfather orne would scowl and clear his throat querulously there ain't no young feller round these parts good enough for our milly he would declare obdurately i don't see why you talk the way you do mother milly's all right just as she is a-living with us i don't want to part with her i ain't going to neither 
Maybe Grandpa was losing his memory, reflected Mrs. Orne, her faded eyes fixed on vacancy. She guessed it would be a blessing if he did. Nonetheless, she began, when Milly was little more than sixteen, to set cunningly baited traps for the honest young farmers of the countryside. Spicy cakes, shining twists of molasses taffy or big fat crullers, suited to lusty young appetites and flanked by pictures of raspberry shrub or new cider, were always forthcoming when Milly had a bow. "'You can't never tell,' Grandma would murmur mysteriously, as she passed her granddaughter's admirers in keen-eyed review through a crack of the door. "'I'm a-going to keep my eye on him, and on her.' To Milly, uneasily conscious of the old lady's espionage, she would say, "'You can't be too particular, honey, when it comes to dealing with men folk. There ain't a girl alive that rightly understands em, but I'll tell you one thing,' lowering her voice and nodding her old wise head. Don't you never let one of em kiss you, nor so much as lay a finger on you till you're engaged to be married and me and Grandpa has given our blessing. Now you mind what I say. Oh yes, I know there's plenty of foolish girls as'll tell you different, and like as not you think your Grandma's too old to know what's what. But I reckon men folks about the same as they was when I was young. Styles ain't changed much as far as they're concerned since Bible days. Of course, I wouldn't want to say anything against the patriarchs, but I should think they'd really hate to have accounts of some of their doings handed down from generation to generation, and nice women are reading of them in course, and having to skip chapters in Sunday school and all. But I want you should get married, Milly, and have a good, honest husband to take care of you when me and Grandpa is laid away. But at this... Milly would stop the old woman's mouth with one of the kisses forbidden to men, crying out that she didn't want any husband. Why should she when she was perfectly happy as she was? A sentiment loudly applauded by Grandfather, but over which Mrs. Orne shook her head dubiously. This ain't no kind of a world for a lone woman, was her disparaging opinion. Not that I think much of men folks. Most of them's a pretty poor lot, from the patriarchs down. "'All but me,' Grandpa would crow with a prodigious wink at Milly, a proceeding which invariably elicited a dignified reproof from Grandma to the effect that no real gentleman ever opened and shut one eye that away. And say what one would, a conceited uppity man was enough to make a body wish to die single. Milly Orne was eighteen when the daffodils came into bloom. Grandmother couldn't bear the sight of a daffodil, and by that token she was prettier than ever, as Mrs. Pettibone had observed. Yet she was neither safely married nor even engaged, a fact which Mrs. Orne took sadly to heart. But when the old lady cited the warning prophecy concerning woods and crooked sticks with pungent comments of her own, the girl put her pretty head on one side, her eyes scattering blue sparkles of mirth. They're all crooked sticks, Grandma, she laughed. And when I've come quite through the wood, I'll see a fairy prince riding towards me, and then... For God's sake, don't say that, Milly! cried Mrs. Orne shrilly. All the colour dropped out of her old face, leaving it grey and twisted and gaunt, like a dead tree in the wind. Don't... don't say it! Oh, I guess maybe I ain't feeling so well this morning. Get me a swallow of tea, honey, and don't say nothing to Grandpa. She still sat bowed over, shivering a little and murmuring to herself when the girl brought her the cup of hot tea she had hastened to prepare. "'You didn't mean it, did you, honey?' she asked, raising herself to peer into the girl's face. "'Mean what? What did I say to worry you, Grandma? entreated Milly. "'I didn't mean... Oh, about the... You ain't met no strange man lately, have you? Somebody me and Grandpa don't know. I'm kind of feared of strangers, honey.' The girl soothed her with tears and laughter and denials, and presently, when the steady thump, thump, thump of the loom proclaimed the old woman's restored equanimity, she stole away on pretense of carrying flowers to the minister's wife. End of chapter 8
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The Door Ajar Milly Orne had known Mrs. Pettibone for as many years as she could well remember. It was Miss Philura, indeed, who had taught the girl many a floral secret when Milly was a faithfully visited member of that conscientious lady's Bible class. In her new estate, the wife of the minister appeared as if mysteriously translated to another plane of existence. Milly gazed at her with respectful admiration as she replied with brief sentences to various gentle inquiries. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Grandfather's pretty well. Only his back. He won't let me dig all the garden, and the loam's stiff and heavy in the spring. Grandmother's making some carpet for Mrs. Buckthorn. Oh, yes, ma'am. I've learned to weave. But Mrs. Buckthorn's so particular. Grandma Dacent let me weave her carpet. I can't make it quite so even yet. Mrs. Pettibone, sitting opposite her young visitor in the cool light of the shaded parlour, marvelled anew at the fresh loveliness of the girl's face. "'But you're a great help and comfort to the old people, Milly,' she said encouragingly. "'Mr. Pettibone and I were speaking of it only the other day.' The girl leaned forward in her chair, her hands gripping each other in her lap. "'It is that I wanted to ask you about,' she murmured. "'I'm afraid I'm not so very much help. "'I wondered if you could advise me.' Mrs. Pettibone's mind reverted for a swift instant to the tragedy of eighteen years back. She hoped no one had told the child. "'Well, you'll tell me all about it, won't you?' she said, trembling a little under the weight of her responsibilities. "'And then, if I can't advise you, I'll ask Mr. Pettibone when he comes in.' She straightened herself rather proudly. "'Mr. Pettibone,' she repeated, "'will be sure to know.' The girl drew a deep breath. "'I want to work,' she said abruptly. "'But you do, my dear. "'All oh, those lovely flowers!' And the girl made a disparaging gesture. "'I want to earn money,' she said. "'I must!' Mrs. Pettibone looked distressed. "'Oh, I do hope,' she began, "'you'll let me consult Mr. Pettibone. "'The Deacon's Fund—' "'Oh, I don't mean we're cold or hungry,' cried the girl, with a proud upflinging of her pretty head. "'We're not in need of charity, yet.' "'My dear Milly,' protested the minister's wife, very pink and agitated. "'I didn't—' oh, "'Won't you let me tell you?' the girl interrupted. "'Of course, it isn't the same now as when I was a little girl. "'I didn't think very much then, nor notice how different I was to other girls.' Mrs. Pettibone gasped involuntarily. "'Oh, I hope no one has been so thoughtless,' she murmured. "'Go on, please.' Milly gazed at her in some perplexity. "'Well, other girls had fathers and mothers,' she explained. "'I had neither, and I didn't realise that grandfather and grandmother would grow old and feeble, while I was, well, before I was—' Mrs. Pettibone nodded understandingly. "'You were always a good girl, Milly,' she said. "'You've been a comfort to them, my dear, indeed. "'You don't know how much. "'And everything will come right, "'if you'll only be patient and trust. "'Perhaps you think I'm only saying this "'because I'm the minister's wife. "'You do think so, don't you?' "'Oh, no, ma'am, I don't,' the girl said politely. "'And I've tried. I do try. "'But Grandfather can't work so hard much longer.' Yesterday, when he was planting the garden, his hands trembled so the seeds spilled all over the ground. He didn't want me to see, and I pretended not to. And the roof leaks so the rain comes right down through the kitchen ceiling. Grandpa's fixed it the best he could, but nearly all the shingles are rotten. It'll be a lot worse next winter. Mrs. Pettibone was instant with breathless expressions of sympathy and hope. One shouldn't ever expect misfortune, she reminded herself and Milly, but only the good, which was everywhere, ready to become one's very own, if one would only take it. But not a roof, inquired Milly doubtfully, and new flannels for grandmother, and everything, affirmed Mrs. Pettibone stoutly. Her blue eyes became rather wistful as she repeated, everything, in a voice so low Milly could scarcely hear it. 
"'It must be nice to think so,' sighed the girl unbelievingly. She had been playing with her handkerchief, rolling it into a tight ball at which she gazed unseeingly. "'I wanted to work in the mills last winter,' she said at last, "'but they wouldn't let me.' "'I don't wonder,' Mrs. Pettibone said warmly. "'That would never do.' "'I don't see why I shouldn't work in the mills,' persisted Milly. "'I ought to work to take care of them. "'What will become of them if I don't?' "'She gazed at the minister's wife from under puckered brows. "'Mrs. Pettibone, thinking of that other Millicent Orne, was silent, "'striving to share the girl's perplexities from the vantage ground of her sadder knowledge. "'Presently Milly spoke again. "'I'd like to tell you something else,' she said, her lashes lowered upon pink cheeks, if you won't think me silly. No, indeed, my dear, promised Mrs. Pettibone, surreptitiously whisking a tear from her lashes. Grandmother, Grandmother wants me to be married, Milly confessed hurriedly. She talks to me about it. Oh, but, but Miss Fuliora, how can I be married when I don't love anyone? Oh, you can't, of course. Oh, certainly not murmured the minister's wife, aware of Mrs. Orne's ambitions for her granddaughter, as well as the pitiful reason for them. But perhaps, some time, one doesn't always know of all the beautiful things in store. The misused handkerchief was being swiftly rolled into a slim white rod under the girl's busy fingers. Mrs. Pettibone watched them absently. "'That's what I said to Grandmother this morning,' said Milly. "'She was telling me I'd go through the woods and pick up a crooked stick at last.' "'Mrs. Pettibone made a slight gesture of impatient dissent. "'But I can't help it,' the girl went on. "'I couldn't marry just to be married, and I've never seen anyone round here. "'Perhaps, as you say, someone will come, some day. "'Somebody I haven't always known.' Her eyes suddenly lifted from their trivial task, surprised a look of poignant distress on the older woman's face. "'Oh, you do think me silly,' she cried with sudden sharp resentment. "'You're looking at me just as Grandma does when—' "'No, no, my dear, you are quite mistaken,' Mrs. Pettibone denied hurriedly. "'And—but well, that reminds me of something I had forgotten. "'I wonder—' if you chance to know anything about the family who've taken the old Eggleston place for the summer. Milly shook her head dejectedly. She was thinking she must go, and that after all her visit to the parsonage had been useless. Only this morning, Mrs. Pettibone said with some eagerness, I received a note from Mrs. Hill. I was very much surprised, but Mr. Pettibone says it was because we called on them. We'd just come from the farm the day we stopped at your house and you gave me the daffodils. You remember? Milly was drawing on her cotton gloves. She wished she hadn't come. They seemed like nice people, the hills, I mean, but different somehow, not used, perhaps, to doing their own housework. Young Mrs. Hill is hardly more than a child, and not... Well, I imagine she may find it rather lonely up there. Well, they want someone to help in the house, and Mrs. Hill mentioned thirty dollars a month. The girl drew a sudden breath. Do you mean that I... Are you thinking... Mrs. Pettibone wrinkled her forehead perplexedly. Oh, well, it just occurred to me that possibly... Oh, yet I'm not sure it would do. Oh, really, I ought to have consulted Mr. Pettibone before speaking of it to you. I could earn over a hundred dollars before fall, cried Milly, her face shining with joy. Oh, but you would be a servant in their house... I'm afraid they're the sort of people who would think of you in just that way. Besides, Mrs. Pettibone was vaguely uneasy as she recalled the older Mrs. Hill's opaque eyes. I fear your grandmother would object, she finished. There'd be hard work to do, and Millie Orne lifted her blonde head proudly. I'm not afraid of work, she said, nor of what they might think of me. In the end, she went away carrying one of Mrs. Pettibone's small sheets of notepaper folded into a neat triangle, after a fashion obtaining in Mrs. Pettibone's girlhood for correspondence of a polite but informal nature, and directed to Mrs. Hill. "'I'm afraid I oughtn't to have done it without consulting you,' Mrs. Pettibone told the minister at supper that night. 
but poor Milly was so eager, and the opportunity was an unusual one. Milly is quite right in wanting to put her young shoulder to the wheel, pronounced Mr. Pettibone, whose nerves had been calmed by a long afternoon spent in the open. But we know so little about the hills, objected his wife timorously. We know nothing amiss, he reminded her. Really, my dear, for a person who professes to believe that good is all and all encircling, I know, I know, she acknowledged humbly, I'm always forgetting. One gets so in the habit of suspecting and, and being afraid, and more for other people than for oneself. The minister smiled understandingly. Nevertheless, one shouldn't hang millstones of fear about other people's necks, he commented. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Heart of Filiora by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 A Night of Rain and the Morning After as for Milly Orne, she had fairly flown homeward on the wings of hope and ambition. Already she beheld in imagination a new roof of shining yellow shingles replacing the moss-green expanse so deceitfully picturesque under its sheltering apple boughs. But there was Grandmother Orne to be reckoned with. "'Work out!' cried the old woman, dropping her dishcloth and staring at the girl over her spectacles. "'That's what it amounts to, in spite of all your pretty words, Milly. "'No, I ain't a-going to allow it. "'We've got along all these years, and took care of you besides, "'and I guess we contrived to do so as long as the Lord spares us.' "'Please, Grandmother,' entreated the girl, "'don't say no till we've been to see Mrs. Hill. "'It wouldn't be like working out in the village, and I could earn... "'I'd work my fingers to the bone,' the old woman declared, before I'd see my Milly's child a working in another woman's kitchen. But when Grandfather came in from the barn, his weather-beaten old face was drawn into myriad folds and puckers of distress. He had found the dun cow lying dead in the corner of the pasture, her tongue protruding from her mouth. She must have ate something, the old man surmised heavily. Oh, I don't know what in creation twas. She was all right this morning, far as I could see. She's dead now. He sat down by the stove, though it was a warm evening, and spread his shriveled hands over the griddles. Yes, yeah, she's dead all right, he repeated in a mumbling monotone. And she was the best milker of the two. Red heifer, oh, she's a getting old. I don't know, I don't know. Mrs. Orne had wrapped her head in her checkered apron at the first word and hobbled out to the orchard where the red cow, peacefully oblivious of the tragedy, was chewing her cud under the budding apple trees. She came in presently, her glasses pushed high above her forehead, a little angry spot of colour on either cheek. "'Twas them russet apples, Grandpa," she said shrilly. "'I told you not to give em to the cows. She got one stuck in her throat and choked to death, plain as a pipe staff." Oh, them russets weren't no good, the old man objected feebly. I says to you, yes, I know you did, Grandpa, and I told you. No, wife, you let me speak for once, can't ye? The old voice rose tremulous but determined. I says to you, mother, I says, the cows will relish these here apples, I says, and they ain't no good for cooking any more, and you... I give in to you as usual, the old woman said bitterly. Once you get an idea in your head, there ain't nobody on earth. Oh, please, Grandmother, interrupted Milly, winding her young arms about the old woman's neck. Don't scold poor Grandpa. He only wanted to give the cows a little treat. But I told him they was likely to choke on them apples. If he'd have took the pains to cut them in two. Well, you might have done that for me if you were so blamed smart and knowing, put in Grandfather, bitter in his turn. I was trying my best to get the beets and the peas into the ground before it rained. Lord, I don't know what we're going to do without that cow. She was the best milker of the two. The red heifer's getting old. Getting old. That's what's the matter with all of us, I guess. Getting old and foolish. <laughs> 
I'm not getting old, Grandfather, cried little Milly, her pink cheek pressed softly against his withered one. And I'll not allow you to say you're foolish. You're the wisest man I know. Oh, you think so, honey? He shook his head despondently. No, I ain't. I ain't never really held up my head since your mother died. I ought to have suspicion that young fella. Grandpa! Mrs. Orne's voice was sharp with fear. Oh, yes, mother, oh, that's so. I forgot. Well, I ain't going to say no more. He lay down presently on the old lounge, and Milly covered him warmly with the crazy quilt she had pieced the winter before. I guess he'll feel better when he wakes up, the girl said, as she tucked the gay covering tenderly about the bent shoulders. Her lips were set in firm sweet curves as she hurried the remaining dishes to the pantry shelf and made all tidy for the night. Mrs. Orne did not appear to notice the girl's movements. She had dropped into a chair by the window, her withered lips moving soundlessly, her faded eyes fixed on vacancy. More and more often of late Milly had come upon her thus. Tonight, something in the aspect of the dim little room, the old man already stertorously asleep, and the grandmother's white head silhouetted against the sombre reds and purples of sunset, stirred, poignant, intolerable in the girl's young breast. It was as though for once she saw them through other eyes, other, but not alien. A great, aching tenderness possessed her, and she fell upon her knees at her grandmother's side. "'You will let me help,' she cried in a passion of self-giving. "'You must let me help.' The day following that night of sorrowful revelation marked the vernal moment when the chill conjecture of spring gives place to the shining certainty of summer. A warm rain had fallen during the dark hours before dawn, and the first faint beams of morning shone upon a world marvellously transfigured. Gnarled apple boughs, where only the day before crisp pinkish buds had shone dimly among the small pale leaves, flung scented garlands of lavish bloom to the wind, and amid the fresh green of the young grass, dark violets and purple-pink wild geraniums unfolded myriad blossoms to the light. For the first time in her young life, Milly Orne had lain long awake in her little chamber under the roof. How could she have been so blind, so selfish all these years, she asked herself. How they worked and sacrificed for her, Grandmother toiling late into the night at her loom that Milly might wear a new dress to the country dance. Grandfather carrying milk to his customers on cold mornings in winter and laughing at Milly's offers of help. No, no, he'd say, this ain't no kind of work for a little girl like you. You stay home with your grandma and keep warm by the stove. <laughs> Once, she remembered, Grandfather had been stiff with rheumatism for a week and Grandmother had insisted upon taking the milk. "'Me and Grandpa don't want you should peddle milk,' the old woman had protested. "'We ain't a-going to allow it, neither. You stay home and wait on your Grandpa.' It had been the same with all the heavier tasks about the house and garden. Grandmother never allowed Milly to wash the clothes of a Monday. She might pin them on the line if she must do something. But there ain't no sense, said Grandmother briskly, in your spoiling your pretty hands when mine's all wrinkled and out of shape anyhow. Likewise, and for similar reasons, she'd been forbidden to milk, to scrub the floors, or to dig the vegetables. It was all clear to Milly now, as she lay wide-eyed in the darkness, listening to the soft patter of the rain above her head. She beheld herself, always shielded, indulged, idolised by the two old people, growing strong and beautiful, while year by year their bent shoulders stooped lower beneath the burden. Then her quickened thoughts hovered about Grandfather, crouched over the fire, his distorted old hands with their blackened and broken nails shaking a little, as he described the disaster which had befallen the dun cow. "'I ain't held up my head since your mother died,' he had said, and... I ought to have suspicioned that young feller. Did he mean her father? Once, when she was a small child, Grandmother had taken her to the churchyard, where in a distant corner, sheltered from unfriendly winds and prying eyes by a row of thrifty young pines, 
was a solitary grave. At its head a simple white stone bore the name Milly, with the dates of birth and death. Milly remembered how she had chased a butterfly in the sun, while Grandmother cleared the encroaching lichens from the stone and made a narrow mound bright with pansies fetched from the garden at home. She had captured the butterfly at last with a shout of triumph, bringing it all spoiled and broken to Grandmother. Never had she forgotten the look on the grief-stained old face. That's just what happened to her, Grandmother said, in a voice not her own. Then, with a sudden harshness, Go away, child. You've got his look in your eyes. All this while the sound of the rain on the roof deepened to a steady roar. And then, somehow, the churchyard with its gleaming stones and the wind in the pines and the gravely bright faces of the pansies set in prim rows on the narrow mound became confused. Grandmother's voice came to her from a great way off, not harsh now, but cadenced with patient grief. You've got his luck in your eyes, my child. His look in your eyes. It was broad daylight when Milly awoke, and already the bees were busy among the apple blossoms under her window. As the girl hurriedly made her simple toilet, she heard sounds from below, the clash of stove lids and the click of cups and saucers. I'm so ashamed, Grandma, was her greeting, as she surprised the old woman in the act of cutting thick slices from a brown loaf. Why didn't you call me? Because I'd rather you sleep, replied Grandmother defiantly. There ain't no call for you to be up at five in the morning, as I know of. She set the thick slices in order on a blue-edged plate. They've took the cow away already, she added. Grandpa, he seen to it first thing. We'll get a good bit for the hide and taller, and I guess there ain't no call for anybody to worry. I can stand it without so much milk to look after, as far as I'm concerned. Milly said nothing. But after she'd cleared away the breakfast things and made everything tidy about the little house, she pinned a hat of blue straw over her blonde braids and crossed the room to where her grandmother already sat at the loom, busy tying on. "'I'm going, Grandma,' she said, trying hard to keep a quiver out of her voice. The old woman glanced up sharply from her task. "'Going?' she echoed. "'Going where? "'This ain't no time of day to gad. "'It's too early for the mail. "'Sides, Grandpa, I'm going,' said Milly firmly, "'to see Mrs. Hill. "'If she'll hire me at thirty dollars a month, I can—' "'She had expected sharp expostulation, even denial. "'But to her surprise, the old woman burst into a loud cackle of laughter. "'Sit down,' she ordered, "'and get busy picking out all the blue in that there basket.' "'But, Grandmother,' expostulated the girl, glancing at the small nickel clock, which shamed with its noisy activities the silent, dignified old timepiece in the corner. "'It's late. I'm afraid she'll find somebody else.' Oh, "'Let her,' quoth Mrs. Orne. "'You sit down, dearie, and let me talk to you a spell. you got money in the bank and never knowed it all these years.' "'I've money in the bank?' Milly gazed incredulously at the old face, hard twisted, in a look of strangely blended pain and triumph. Uh huh, the old woman nodded. It's been there since before you was born. In your name, too. Me and Grandpa never touch it, but it's yours, honey. You don't have to work in nobody's kitchen. But how did I come to have any money? Milly was industriously sorting the blue racks from the mass of heterogeneous material in the basket. She pulled out a long strip of figured cotton stuff and began to wind it upon the ball in her lap. "'Oh, don't put in that striped gingham,' snapped Mrs. Orne. "'That goes into the basket, don't you see? "'I don't know as it makes any difference to you where the money come from, as long as it's yourn.' "'Is there enough for Grandfather to buy another cow with and fix the roof?' Mrs. Orne snapped off a bit of warp with a loud clash of her big shears. Ridiculous, she exclaimed sharply. Tain't ourn to use. Well, if it's mine, began Milly. It's yourn, just as I said, Mrs. Orne pronounced in a hard voice. Well, you can't spend it the way you said. It's, well, for, oh, Lord, I wish you'd go out and work in your posies. The flowers de loose is all in blow this morning. 
Run out and see em, honey. I got to get these here breaths out of the loom before they were this afternoon. Go on, you're hindering me. Milly had put her arms about the old woman's neck from behind. I won't go a step, she said firmly, till you tell me. How much money have I got? I knew you'd pester the life out of me, scolded her grandmother. I told Grandpa so, but he was set. If she's bound on going out to work, he says. You told Grandfather? Mrs. Orne nodded. Then she turned suddenly and faced the girl. We don't know nothing about them hill folks, she said shrilly. Why in creation should you go off and leave me and Grandpa for a fool notion? I'll give Mrs. Pettibone a piece of my mind next time I see her. She ain't got no call to... I asked her, interrupted Milly. I must do something to help. Can't you see, Grandma? I can't live here and do nothing. You say I have money, and if you... No, no, cried Mrs. Orne. She threw her apron over her head with the tragic gesture of the countryside. Milly listened to her sobbing in perplexed silence. Presently, Mrs. Orne lowered the apron from her face, and it was seen that within its familiar sanctum she had regained something of her lost composure. "'Losing the cow and all kind of upset me,' she muttered. And then, with sudden sharpness, "'We don't want you should use that money for us. "'We'd have given it back long ago if you'd know where it come from. "'But it ain't as if you didn't have nothing. "'And I guess, when it comes to that, you've got the right—' "'Did my father give me the money?' asked Milly, in a clear, distinct voice. Her blue eyes narrowed slightly, gazed straight at her grandmother. I think I'm old enough to know, she added slowly. Mrs. Orne stared at the girl, her mouth dropping open a little. I never thought you favoured him, she said under her breath. You're like our Milly. But, but there's times when you put me in mind. She stopped suddenly. I'm going to tell you, she went on, after a lengthening pause. It was your father. He sent two hundred dollars to Milly with a letter. And after she died, well, of course, it was yours by rights. Me and Grandpa wouldn't have touched a penny of it, not if we were starving. And it's been in the bank ever since, drawing interest. Milly's fair young face had grown very pale. She walked towards the door. Her head, with its mass of blonde braids topped by the small blue hat, thrown slightly back. I'm going now, she said gently, but I'll be home before dark. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 A Little Journey in the World the road leading to the Eggleston farm might, for the sheer wild loveliness of it, have conducted one straight to paradise. But Milly, walking swiftly between myriads of fluttering leaves and blossoms, jewelled thick with the lavish splendours of rain and sun, paid scant heed to its beauty. She was painfully conscious of old Mrs. Orne, sitting alone before the loom, its steady thump, thumping, marking the heavy rhythm of her thoughts and the money, of which she had never been told, and which had been drawing interest all these years. Why should the mere memory of it kindle so strange a fire in those mild eyes? Athwart the crystal pool of Milly's mind, an ominous shadow had fallen. But she had not sufficient knowledge of the world, of either books or men, to guess the truth. Something strange had befallen her father and mother. This much was clear. Had he deserted her in her hour of need, sending the money in lieu of his presence? Such cruelty was unthinkable. Yet her grandmother's words had clearly implied it. And afterward, what could have become of him? She had always supposed herself orphaned of both father and mother. And yet, now that she considered the matter, grandmother had never said so. The thought of a father, cold and unloving, perhaps not even aware of her existence, dimmed the warm rose of her cheek, 
and her blue eyes lifted suddenly at the sound of a horse's hoofs in the road behind her were full of vague trouble the horse a bright bay sidled by with a wild glance at the girl's slim blue figure in its little fluttering cape his rider spoke to him sharply touching spurred heels to the animal's glossy flank they had passed in an instant the man hastily touching his cap with a muttered word of apology milly watched the two figures man and horse seeming like one as they topped the rise just ahead she did not remember to have seen either before in the flashing moment of their encounter she had noticed his keen dark eyes and his riding clothes of a fashion unfamiliar to the country roads about innisfield the single look he had cast in her direction appeared to question her presence on the narrow road leading to the eggleston farm yet such are the intricacies of the human heart milly orne ceased to think further of her mysterious father who had somehow managed to earn grandmother's undying hatred and of the money which nobody wanted drawing interest in the innisfield savings bank it should continue to draw interest for all of her thought milly with a spirited toss of her pretty head if none of it could be spent to bring comfort to the two old people it was useless to her she was strong and could earn money which she would spend as she liked once more milly beheld in imagination the rows upon rows of yellow shingles shining in the sun and this time she added a dun cow to her picture a young and beautiful dun cow peacefully chewing the safe cud of contentment in grandfather's pasture there were fresh hoof prints in the moist gravel of the drive winding between the stately gateposts of the old eggleston place as milly rounded a curve in the road densely masked with flowering shrubs she beheld the bay horse standing meekly enough with trailing bridle before the side entrance of the house the young man who had ridden him was talking with a woman under the shelter of the portico neither of them appeared to notice milly's timid approach she paused and drew back a little at the sight of the man's passionate gesture of denial he was evidently angry at something the woman was saying in an indistinguishable voice i'll do nothing of the sort milly heard him say loudly i'll be hanged if i will you push a fellow too hard mother then both turned suddenly conscious of the girl's shrinking presence what are you doing here the woman said sharply the young man had already flung himself upon the horse and ridden violently away everything about him seemed violent milly thought the woman repeated her question in a more conventional tone what do you wish her cold imperturbable eyes were busy with the girl's face and figure i came to see mrs hill milly replied timidly uh, mrs pettibone I, I have a note from her i am mrs hill the woman said and extended her hand for the triangular message bearing her name have you read this she demanded raising her eyes from its swift perusal read it echoed milly her colour rising oh no ma'am certainly not well it seems from this you are not an ordinary servant commented mrs hill sweeping the girl's slim figure with an appraising stare i don't know whether you'll do i should prefer an elderly woman with experience still can you cook i've never cooked except at home hesitated milly very pink and trembling under the scrutiny of the woman's eyes perhaps i oughtn't to say i can i know how to prepare vegetables and cook them and meat i can make pies too grandfather likes my pies better than grandmother's i am strong and i can make plain cake and molasses cake and you look healthy the woman conceded harshly she sighed heavily yet with a touch of impatience if you try me just to-day the girl went on timidly i should like to go home nights where do you live milly pointed vaguely it's not far she said down the road a piece in the village oh no ma'am grandfather's house is quite away this side of the village mrs hill considered the girl's reply in a silence which appeared to connect itself with mrs pettibone's modest communication 
Millie watched the strong white fingers tear the paper into strips, then twice across, in a bewilderment which presently deepened into resentment. Grandmother, she thought, wouldn't like her to stand here begging for work, when, after all, there was money which belonged to her by rights. I think I'll try you, Mrs. Hill announced, looking up suddenly from her work of demolition. She allowed the bits of paper to escape negligently from her plump white hands. You may come in. I see you're dressed for work. Yes, ma'am, said Milly Orne meekly. I've never been without a servant before, Mrs. Hill observed, as she piloted Milly into a large, disorderly kitchen. She turned and faced the girl before a table covered with soiled dishes. Perhaps Mrs. Pettibone has already told you of us? she demanded interrogatively. Her eyes demanded instant reply. Milly shook her head. She said you were... Oh, that you'd only lived here a little while. We came here for my daughter's, for Mrs. Walter Hill's health, the woman said slowly. Now kindly pay attention to what I tell you. I shall not repeat it, nor must you. Do you understand? You are not to talk to anyone of what you see or hear in my house while you are employed here. She paused, her eyes under gathered brows, gazing opaquely at the girl. Of course, I shouldn't think of, began Milly proudly. Mrs. Hill cut her short with an impatient gesture. Not that there is anything in the least peculiar or even interesting in our living here. My daughter-in-law, soon after her marriage to my son, fell into a nervous almost hysterical condition. Our physician advised country air and a complete change of climate and environment, and through my agent I learned of this place and took it for a year. There are only the three of us, my son, his wife, and myself. Now, I think you know all that is necessary to know. The flow of words spoken in a low, hurried voice suddenly ceased, but the woman still stood, one plump hand resting on the table her eyes riveted upon the girl's listening face. Perhaps, she resumed suddenly, I ought to reassure you on one point. My son's wife, while exceedingly nervous and unstrung, is perfectly rational, except on one or two points. She had a strange fancy concerning her husband, which our physician assures us will disappear in due time. Her mental condition, in short, is not wholly unnatural in view of the facts in the case. I am telling you this so that in case Sylvia, Mrs. Hill, should say anything to you, if she should even attempt to talk to you, kindly report the circumstance at once to me. Your failure to do so might involve us all in great trouble. Do you understand? Milly was looking down, feeling very hot and uncomfortable. I should not talk to anyone, she said coldly. I wish to earn money. That's why I came. I should do my work. Oh, as to wages, Mrs. Hill observed after a slight pause. You'd hardly expect more than twenty dollars. Milly gazed at the woman with slightly narrowed eyes. Mrs. Pettibone told me you would pay thirty, she said slowly. I mentioned thirty dollars in my note to Mrs. Pettibone, conceded Mrs. Hill. An experienced servant would be worth that much. You are merely an untrained girl. It's not at all likely you can cook anything we could eat, to say nothing of waiting on table or fine laundry work. I shall have to show you everything. These were incontrovertible facts. Milly turned them slowly over in her mind. Then she put forward a fact quite as incontrovertible. There are no experienced servants in Innisfield, she asserted. You will not find any. Nearly everyone is busy at home or in the mills. She looked towards the door, which stood open, revealing a stretch of unshorn grass and a weedy flower border beyond. She was thinking she'd go home and beg Grandmother to let her work in the mills. Perhaps now that the cow was dead, Grandmother would give her consent. Well... I'll give you thirty dollars, Mrs. Hill said sharply. I'm obliged to have someone at once. Take off your hat and go to work. This kitchen must be put to rights first. We have luncheon at one and dinner. She broke off suddenly at the sound of an opening door. <laughs> 
Milly saw her face change queerly, and when she spoke again, her voice was soft and purring. Sylvia, my dear, this is our new maid. By the way, what is your name? Oh, Milly, Milly Orne. That is a very pretty name, and odd for a maid. Milly, this is Mrs. Walter Hill, my son's wife. I believe you saw Mr. Hill. He was talking with me when you came. Really, your sudden appearance quite startled me. I wasn't expecting such good fortune. Milly turned and saw a tall girl standing in the doorway, staring at her with a mixture of curiosity and sullen defiance in her dark face. Her eyes were slightly swollen and discoloured, as if with recent tears, and her mouth drooped dispiritedly at the corners. Mrs. Hill walked resolutely toward the door and attempted to pass her arm around the girl's waist. "'Come, Sylvia, my dear,' she said coaxingly. "'Suppose we leave Milly to her work and go for a ramble in the woods. It will do you good.' The girl's mutinous face quivered as she threw off the caressing hand. "'Don't, mother,' she exclaimed irritably. "'You know I can't bear it.' But she turned to follow with seeming docility. Milly heard the door close behind the two women and the sound of their retreating steps in the uncarpeted passage. Left quite alone in the midst of the untidy kitchen, Milly looked around for a nail on which to hang her hat. Then she invested her slim person in the clean checkered apron she had brought with her. The fire had gone out in the cook stove and the water in the old-fashioned reservoir was cold. There was neither wood nor kindling to be found in the box behind the stove. After a moment of indecision, Milly opened one of several doors in search of the woodshed. There were steps descending to a brick-floored room, its one cobwebbed window opening upon the green gloom of a grassy bank overgrown with rampant lilac shoots. Hmm, the milk room, decided Milly, looking about the rows of dusty shelves and the pails and pans, once shining silver bright, but now dim with the rust of long disuse. There was a sound of running water in the cold greenish gloom, where a sparkling spring gushed from a wooden pipe, falling with a musical drip and gurgle into a rude trough, thence disappearing through a hole in the floor. A second door, half open, disclosed to Milly's inquiring gaze a pantry of ample proportions, well stocked with ancient crockery and utensils. The shelf before the open window bore a heterogeneous collection of grocer's supplies, a pot of butter melting in the sun, a tumbler of jam besieged by darting flies, a baker's loaf cut crookedly across, and sugar spilled from a broken bag, and already under convoy of a procession of industrious ants, a tin pail half filled with milk, in which divers of the besieging force had met ignominious defeat. She found the woodshed at last, and the sight of its ordered rows of hickory sticks and the plentiful supply of chips, bespeaking former days of thrift and industry, somehow restored her drooping spirits. A competent fire soon crackled in the rusty stove. Then Milly attacked the piled-up dishes on the table, wondering a little how three people could possibly have employed so many plates, cups and utensils in the course of a single breakfast. There were other things over which to wonder. A quantity of silver spoons and forks thrown negligently into an iron saucepan in which milk had been burned. A broken plate of delicate porcelain containing a fragment of yellow soap. A silent clock on the mantel, pointing to the hour of six. Milly searched for and found the key. She didn't know the hour, but guessed it to be ten. The clock struck busily, its harsh, rasping voice seeming to rebuke the desolating disorder of the old kitchen. Then Milly bethought her once more of the butter melting in the sun. Obviously the milk-room, with its penetrating coolness, was the place for perishable foods. What might a trained servant do under existing circumstances, she wonder? one really worth the thirty dollars a month she had so boldly exacted. Still pondering this question, she plunged the pot of butter in the cool water of the spring, undertook salvage work on the milk pail and sugar bag, and then fell to washing the dishes, tables, shelves, everything in sight. 
a step on the newly cleansed floor caused her to look up from rueful contemplation of a drawer in the kitchen cupboard crammed to bursting with soiled table linen the tall young man whom she had last seen riding violently away on his bay horse stood near the door looking about him with an air of astonishment he still wore his riding clothes spattered with the mud of fast and furious travel he glanced at milly with a certain lighting of his sombre young face remotely suggesting a smile are you here to stay he propounded i don't know milly replied if i suit perhaps suit you mean i'm not an experienced oh, she hesitated with a slight pucker of her white forehead i've never worked out before you don't look in the least like a servant he said with a brusqueness which suggested his mother rummy old hole this kitchen i've done my best but it's not exactly in my line i'm not uh, experienced either milly was silent her eyes bent upon the mass of soiled linen she was sorting he did not go away however but reached for a glass on the table i came in for a drink of that bully water he stated best thing about the place he came back presently whistling under his breath clever idea of yours to put the butter and milk in the water he commented there seems to be no ice man about and no refrigerator we didn't happen to think of your little scheme still milly did not reply mrs hill she could not help reflecting appeared to have bestowed scant attention upon her kitchen and everything connected with it the singular young man stared at her with gathered brows oh, i suppose i ought to have tackled these dishes yesterday or the day before he broke out after a lengthening pause mother well you see she's busy most of the time and sylvia well none of us were exactly prepared for the life here it appears to keep one comfortably busy just to exist doesn't it to exist and clear away the debris where is mother anyhow i don't know said milly she walked across to the stove and replenished the fire and then she looked at the clock if you would kindly tell me the time i set the clock by guessing he assisted the old clock to a more exact performance of its duties with an almost eager air of friendliness uh, couldn't we have something to eat pretty soon he asked over his shoulder milly stole a bewildered glance at him mrs hill said dinner oh no luncheon she hesitated over the seldom used word was to be at one but she didn't tell me well he said luncheon hath a pleasant sound suppose i help you a bit mother ought to be doing it but i know where some of the stuff is what can you cook baked potatoes milly suggested doubtfully baked potatoes excellent what else can you toss up a good omelette you mean eggs of course i attempted it one day it didn't sound hard in the cookbook there's a cookbook you know uh, but when it came to the tossing did you ever try it the girl shook her head i don't know what you even mean she said but i can cook eggs different ways oh good eggs different ways it shall be there's bread if that's what you call the curious stuff the grocer brings do you eat out here asked milly timidly i might set the table oh it is the most cheerful spot in the house now you're in it he said with a short laugh but so far we've observed the rules of the game to the extent of eating in the dining room he flung open a door and glanced in with an impatient exclamation i see mother left it to you and you just look here milly beheld a large sparsely furnished room with open windows in the middle of the floor stood a disordered table covered with the remains of a meal eaten several hours before i didn't know she said with desperate courage mrs hill said i wasn't trained well i'm not i didn't think about a dining room mother's fault if she didn't show you was his brusque comment never mind oh, you didn't tell me your name his handsome boyish eyes looked straight into hers milly shook her head i'm afraid i won't do mr hill you're very kind but 
I'm not kind. I want you to stay. Come on, I'll help you hustle these things to the kitchen. It won't take a minute. She obeyed him in perplexed silence. Where could the mistress of this disjointed household be? And the husband of the handsome, sullen-browed girl? Why should he concern himself with neglected breakfast things and the proper way to cook eggs? She resented his half-defiant manner, his boyish eyes, and the jingling spurs on his heels. Nevertheless, she prepared the potatoes he brought her from some unexplored corner, laid the dismantled table with fresh linen and china under his direction, and was in the act of setting a pan of hastily compounded biscuit in the oven when the door opened and Mrs. Hill glided smoothly in. "'Did you think I had quite forgotten you?' was her initial question. Her dull eyes glanced frowningly from the girl's flushed face to that of her son, who stood surveying his mother with a deepening of his defiant air. "'Hard at it as usual, mother,' he said. "'Somebody had to help, you know.' "'I think Sylvia would like to see you, Walter,' she replied, with a significant lifting of her brows. Mrs. Hill stood for some moments, looking blankly about the kitchen. She did not appear to notice what had been accomplished. "'I had intended to return sooner,' she said stiffly. "'You found what was needed? Or did Walter, uh, Mr. Hill?' Milly opened her lips to reply, but the woman went on, a sudden, almost apologetic smile overspreading her features. "'Of course, you've noticed that everything is out of order in the house. I thought at first we should be able to live quite simply without a servant. But there really is so much one doesn't think of, and being unaccustomed... Yes, Mum, said Milly, with down-dropped eyes. Shall I scramble the eggs? The eggs? Oh, yes, Mrs. Hill is fond of omelette. I think there's some in a bag, or... Milly began breaking eggs into a bowl. She set a saucepan over the fire and put a lump of butter in it. Mrs. Hill watched her movements speculatively. "'You appear to know what to do,' she murmured. "'But um, the rasping voice of the clock told the hour of one. "'I'm sorry to be late,' said Milly, in a small, meek voice. "'Oh, that is no matter. "'But Milly tested the potatoes with a practised thumb and finger "'and turned the pan of biscuit. "'They had puffed to a fabulous lightness "'and were beginning to take on a tempting golden brown.' She was thinking determinedly of the thirty dollars. It helped to steady her under the gaze of those singular eyes. She felt vaguely that Mrs. Hill was displeased. The kitchen floor, she ventured timidly, will look better after another cleaning, and so will the tables. The eggs in the saucepan required instant attention. Milly began lifting spoonfuls of the creamy mixture to the top. Into Mrs. Hill's opaque gaze, had crept a sudden gleam of appetite. She appeared to abandon for the moment the train of thought she had been pursuing. "'I must have some coffee,' she said abruptly. "'Serve luncheon at once, and then make some.'" End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Heart of Filiora by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. CHAPTER Twelve, MILLSTONES AND OPPORTUNITIES Despite the minister's perfectly just remark concerning millstones of fear, as related to the necks of other and innocent persons, Mrs. Pettibone continued to indulge small, fluttering anxieties regarding Millie Orne, whom she had undoubtedly helped to precipitate into a new and untried way of life. That Milly had actually gone to work for the hills, she had heard from that well-nigh omniscient person, Mrs. Buckthorn. Mrs. Buckthorn, as was entirely natural for a person athirst for general information, had learned of the circumstance from the grocery man in the village, who had actually seen Milly at work in Mrs. Hill's kitchen. Mr. Obed Salter, in the act of wrapping up a quarter of a pound of mixed tea and a tin can of baking powder, just purchased by the excellent matron, averred that he was somewhat surprised to see the girl down on her hands and knees scrubbing up the floor. He didn't suppose the Orns was that bad off, though they hadn't bought no bill of groceries to speak of for a spell back. 
Mr. Salter's position enabled him to keep, as it were, a sort of commercial barometer, which apprised him, and other persons in his confidence, very exactly, of the varying rises and falls in the finances of his customers. If the wife of the local undertaker, for example, bought lavishly and paid promptly for provisions of the better sort kept in stock by Mr. Salter, that astute gentleman guessed there was considerable sickness and death around. So likewise, items occupying several debit pages of his ledger devoted to the household consumption of Tiff's and the jeweller indicated the fact that folks wouldn't buy nothing they didn't have to these days. Yes, ma'am, said Mr. Salter, addressing himself to Mrs. Buckthorn with philosophical seriousness. This here is a queer world any way you can look at it. Settin' right here in my store, I can tell which way the cat's going to jump nine times out of ten. But the tenth time's got me guessin'. <laughs> he smiled darkly into his change drawer. Mrs. Buckthorn dropped two nickels and a penny into her purse. Do you go out there often? she propounded, intelligently linking Mr. Salter's metaphor with an earlier statement. Oh, you mean the old Eggleston place? Well, I get out there about oh, three times a week, regular. We don't deliver for goods, as a rule, I says to Mrs. Hill, and we don't run no bills. As to that, she says, I don't mind. I'll pay when you bring the stuff. <laughs> They got a horse, and they seems to have a young fella round there with nothing to do. No, they ain't doing nothing with the farm. Ain't even planted a garden patch. Can't make em out exactly. Seem to have money plenty. I fetch em butcher's meat days the cart ain't due. But she's hard to suit, Mrs. Ellis. Wants things I never heard of before. Anchovies and papriki and italian oils in tins and i don't know what all mrs hill i says there ain't no call for them goods in this ere town but if you want em i says and can pay for em i guess i can get em for you plain honest fiddles i says is good enough for the run of my customers what they here for anyhow inquired mrs buckthorn with a comprehensive sniff of disapproval but an eye intent on the crux of the matter the strange articles of food particularised by Mr. Salter inspired in her an active suspicion embracing the persons who exhibited such unnatural appetites and desires. Fleshly lusts, Mrs. Buckthorn characterised them, rolling the Pauline phrase under her tongue with pious unction. Mr. Salter leaned across his counter upon confidential elbows. Well now, that's what I'd like to know. And I put it up to Millie Orne kind of pointedly only yesterday. What sort of folks be they, I says to Millie, now you come to know em intimate. Mm, what did Millie say? I don't know em intimate, she says. Hm, commented Mrs. Buckthorn acidly. She must know whether or not they're Christian people. Well, that's what I says to Millie. Ask the blessing regular at table, I says. And what do you think she says to that? Mrs. Buckthorn shook her head, which sustained a massive structure bristling with sharp pointed feathers of excellent wearing qualities and fearsome aspect. I'm sure I can't imagine, Mr. Salter, she replied in a tone which, while anticipating the worst, was piously prepared for it. I don't eat with them, she says, so I can't tell you. That's what she says. Mr. Salter's face expressed a subtle enjoyment of Mrs. Buckthorn's astonishment. Millie Orne eating at second table? Well, I never. Many's the time she's at at sociables in the church parlour and at Sunday school picnics right along with my own children, for all what's past and gone. Millie don't eat at no second table neither, supplemented Mr. Salter, still enjoyably. She was having her dinner in the kitchen when I got there. Oh, not that I don't eat in the kitchen myself. What's the use, I tell the wife, of mussing up two rooms with victuals. Besides, griddle cakes taste better right smack off the griddle. Oh, you can't beat my wife's buckwheats no matter what you do. <laughs> Mrs. Buckthorn turned to depart. 
the boasting reference to mrs salter's buckwheats jarred upon her sensibilities everybody knew jane salter couldn't cook anything fit to eat i'm afraid the hills ain't my kind of folks she observed moving majestic towards the door her brown paper bag clasped in both hands it's a rule of my life she stated to the pastor's wife when recounting the substance of her conversation with mr salter to say no more than that about anybody folks are either my kind or they ain't if they ain't i can't help it all i can do is to pray for them that's what i tell the deacon mrs pettibone's ingenuous blue eyes expressed a resigned interest in this buckthornian view of one's duty to one's neighbours so you think oh, she hesitated that milly isn't happy with the hills happy echoed mrs buckthorn sonorously happy oh no my dear philura i said nothing with regard to milly orne's happiness why should she be happy you and i know a girl of milly's antecedents ought to consider only her duty well, that's what she's trying to do mrs pettibone made haste to reply she's working to earn money for her grandparents i guess they need it conceded mrs buckthorn with severity i don't take milk of em no more in reply to mrs pettibone's surprised inquiries she stated that the orns had lost their best cow and that for her part she would never encourage anyone to put water in their milk however needy she added darkly that she would say no more mrs pettibone did not report the matter in detail to mr pettibone he appeared to expect an exalted philosophy of life from her which she was very far from constantly practising old habits of thought like miasmatic mists were always closing blindly about her and it was often difficult if not impossible to remember that the only reality in the universe was the all-encircling good as she walked quite alone in the direction of the orne cottage she was striving to bring vividly into the foreground of consciousness the wonderful truth as it had first dawned upon her bewildered mind that day in boston it had seemed to her then so astoundingly simple so sweetly natural that a wayfaring man though a fool might not err therein well she was not a wayfaring man nor yet a fool and perhaps that was the root of the trouble a fool would not be troubled with doubts perplexities and vain hopes nor even with the knowledge of a faded photograph well hidden from view between the leaves of a blotter mrs pettibone walking sedately in her second best alpaca thought with a little pang of her husband whom she had left at his writing table busily engaged upon his sunday evening sermon for young people she had become increasingly scrupulous and painstaking of late whenever it became necessary to disturb the ministerial privacy with calls from the outside world pausing before the study door with a gentle cough of warning or a cautious and prolonged fumbling of the doorknob if he should chance to be looking at the picture she felt she couldn't bear it old mrs orne was a little stiff in her demeanour to her pastor's wife when she opened the door of the cottage to mrs pettibone's knock she had remarked more than once to grandfather that milly had no call to go to the parsonage for advice and counsel so long as she was above the ground and had pointedly announced her intention of giving mrs pettibone a good piece of her mind when opportunity offered but opportunity when it finally arrived wore so sweet and patient a smile was so gentle and sympathetic in manner with eyes so blue under childish brows and small feet scarcely touching the floor from the height of mrs orne's best rush-bottomed chair that the old woman's simmering resentment somehow vanished into thin air i'm glad you come mrs orne said i've been wanting to talk to you about milly you know she's oh well, maybe you put it into her head to work out i kind of got that idea well not exactly she said milly came to tell me that she was most anxious to she paused to choose her words with guileless duplicity dear milly felt now she was quite grown up she wanted to help and so smiling timidly i spoke to her of mrs hill she seemed in great need of someone to assist and milly is such a uh, 
Millie's a smart girl, and she's a good girl, declared Grandma Orne, nodding her head. They don't need nobody to tell me that. But I wanted she should stay right here along with Grandpa and me till she got married. Mrs. Pettibone murmured sympathy and assent. She ain't got no lack of bows, the old woman went on boastfully. Two or three of em's been here this week pestering me about Millie, and I didn't want to tell em she was working out. It would spoil her chance with such likely young fellows as Seth Marvin and Ben Buckthorn and Mrs. Pettibone coughed deprecatingly. But if Millie isn't, um, well, if she doesn't, a girl like Millie can't marry without... Well, no. I hope you didn't go and encourage her in that, Mrs. Orne interrupted shrilly. Falling in love, taking a fancy, <laughs> land. I'd rather she married some good, honest fellow with a few acres of land in his own right. Nate Scrimger wants to build her house with a porch across the front and a sink in the kitchen. I heard him tell her so. <laughs> but Millie, she didn't take no fancy to Nate, so he's quick coming. Oh, but you fell in love with Mr. Orne, suggested Mrs. Pettibone pacifically, didn't you? That ain't neither here nor there, said Mrs. Orne with dignity. You don't come across no young fellers like Grandpa was in his young days. Seems t'was only yesterday he come riding up on his horse to see me, me wearing my new blue calico trimmed with ruffles, <laughs> because I suspicioned he was coming that day. The yellow roses was all in blow. I remember I picked a big posy of them and put them in the window. Thinks I, maybe you'll notice it. He was always fond of flowers, Caleb was, but he didn't even look at them. He jumps off his horse and comes straight to where I was sitting, pretending not to notice and overhanding a seam like all possessed. Millicent, he says. <laughs> the old voice quavered into a silence Mrs. Pettibone did not break. Through the small paned window, she could see Grandfather Orne's stooped figure in its patched blue shirt, busy among the ordered row of vegetables. Perhaps he too was thinking of the day when straight and tall he had leapt off his horse and come straight to the girl, shyly intent upon her sewing, with the words of a masterful wooing upon his lips. Mrs. Orne sighed presently. I've been up there, she said fretfully. To see Milly? I wanted to find out what kind of folks there was. Mrs. Pettibone's eyes expressed a gentle interest mingled with doubt. Well, she murmured. The old woman leaned forward, her knotted hands resting on her knees. I don't know, she said and shook her head. I don't know. You mean you, you didn't? Oh, I seen them, all three of them. The woman was out in the yard when I come. She and the girl was walking round kind of aimless like, and the young feller, her husband, ain't he? Mr. Walter Hill is Mrs. Hill's son. He married his cousin, the young lady you saw, Mrs. Pettibone explained, and then she added doubtfully, He seemed a very pleasant young man. Oh, he does, agreed Mrs. Orne promptly. Mighty pleasant and soft-spoken. Uh, the woman says to me when I ask for Millie, You'll find her in the kitchen, my good woman, she says. Go round back and tell Milly to give you a cup of tea. Girl, she never looked at me at all, no more than as if I was a hop-toad. So I walked round back like I was a beggar woman. At first I told her I didn't want no tea. I had tea at home and plenty of it, thank God. Mrs. Pettibone stirred uneasily in her chair. I'm sure Mrs. Hill meant to be kind, she said, after a little silence, during which the nickel clock on the shelf over her head seemed to tick angrily. Smooth words, but are no parsnips, quoth the old woman oracularly. I wouldn't have cared nothing about her airs, but when I come round the house, I seen him, a standing bareheaded outside the kitchen window, right in a bed of flowers de Lucy was, his arms on the window sill. I stopped right in the middle of my track to see what was up, and pretty soon along comes Millie with a tumbler of water and hands it out to him. Her hair was all curling round her face like she'd been all let up or flustered about something, and her cheeks was as pink as apple blows. 
Lord! Milly is such a pretty girl, the minister's wife said softly. Pretty, echoed Mrs. Orne. Pretty ain't no name for it, I guess I know. But I wish the Lord she was humbly as a hedge fence. I wish she was all pitted up with smallpox. I've seen it spoil many a handsome face in my days. Oh, Mrs. Orne, deprecated the little lady in the rush-bottomed chair. The old woman gave her a powerful look. I guess you ain't forgot already, she said. No more have I. Oh, but Mr. Hill is married, and his wife. There ain't no love lost betwixt them two, else he'd have been out walking round with her instead of talking to my Milly. But you said Milly brought him a glass of water. Surely there was no harm in that, Mrs. Pettibone insisted. And Milly, I trust Milly to know what was right, and Mrs. Orne gave vent to a great groaning sigh, which seemed to tear its way painfully from her breast. Maybe I'm an old fool, she muttered. I guess I be, after all that's come and gone. But I'm awful afeard of strangers. I'm awful afeard. There followed a heavy silence in the room, which the nickel clock on the shelf laboured to fill with its anxious ticking. Outside, long sprays of bridal wreath, just coming into snowy perfection of bloom, blew against the pane. Beyond the good brown earth of the garden, with its rows of sprouting green, was the orchard, dimly pink against a sky mottled with snow-white clouds. A bluebird flitted past, like a flash of mid-heaven, his musical gurgling streaming far behind him. Filiora Pettibone roused herself. There was an all-encircling good. Everything in nature proclaimed it. The certainty of it stirred once more strong and sweet within her breast. Milly is safe, she pronounced slowly. You mustn't be afraid. She is quite, quite safe. The old woman stared with a dull air of resentment. You mean religion, I suppose, she said sullenly. I mean God, half whispered the minister's little wife. Your Milly lives and moves and has her being in God, love, and love will not lose her. Mrs. Orne was rocking her bent old figure from side to side. That's all very well, nice religious kind of talk for them that ain't seen trouble. I used to be awful religious when my Milly was little. Every night I made her say her little prayer a kneeling down by me. And every night regular I said my prayers asking God to take care of my little girl. But there come a night when I could have cursed him to his face. He didn't take no care of my little girl. She was let to be crushed like one of them white flowers in the mud. Since I stood by her coffin with Milly a little wailing might in my arms, I ain't prayed. Oh, but it's true. Only we don't understand. Mrs. Pettibone's troubled face had blanched almost to the colour of the bridal flowers tapping softly on the pane. We don't know, she repeated. We can't, somehow. But God understands. And oh, we must believe God. If we don't, oh, Mrs. Orne, life isn't worth living if we don't believe. Her voice rose, filling every corner of the silent old room, like a clear wind, sent forth to penetrate and scatter dull masses of leaden fog. Milly's grandmother moved a little in her chair, as if the breath of that wind had reached and stirred her heavy thoughts. "'Tain't often I go on this way,' she apologised weakly. "'I know tain't right to be so rebellious. "'But Milly, Milly's all we got left. "'And I am awful feared of strangers.'" End of chapter 12